Jeremiah chapter 3. Chapters 3 through 6 take place during the reign of Josiah. Josiah was a wonderful king, followed one of the worst, the worst king of Judah, Manasseh, the guy who took the southern kingdom of Judah headlong, full-fledged, at accelerated pace, back into full-fledged idolatry that had been changed during an earlier king's time, King Hezekiah. So now... King Josiah comes on the comes on the scene, became king at probably eight years old, maybe 16 years old, but a very young age. And then early on came to just really focus in upon the Lord and go forth, perhaps through the early preaching of Jeremiah. We don't know. But he led a restoration of Judah. He has prophesied over a thousand years before through Moses in the Old Testament. He went through and he cleansed the land and he defiled the altars that were all over the place to other gods throughout Judah. And man, he just went on a rampage, you might say, of cleansing the land like no other king had done before. No other king had done before in Judah. It's awesome. He was a wonderful man. The problem in the day was that people went through, and you've heard me say this before, and I trust before we end uh, the book of Jeremiah, you'll hear me say it again and again. The land went through a reformation, but not a revival. They changed the way they did things. They reformed things. Got rid of all these altars and stuff. Restored the worship in the temple. But the heart was not changed. That was the message, a lot of the message from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a the weeping prophet, full of judgment. Man, we're going to hear some nasty stuff that God says, if you do not return, this is what's going to happen. And you can begin to think, I don't really want to read the book of Jeremiah. It's too depressing. It's going to remind me of all the bad things that will happen to me if I am not perfect. But in the midst of this book, woven throughout it, is the heart of God. God's will. God's will is that none should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. That's God's desire. The scripture clearly tells us that. But there are consequences to action and there are choices that we make. And there is a line that is drawn throughout eternity between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Now, I'm actually wrong in saying throughout eternity looking forward. Because there is a time coming when the kingdom of darkness will be fully dealt with. And there's a swimming pool you don't want to be part of. It's called the lake of fire. Where it says, all things, all things will go who are separated and standing in opposition to go. And finally, death and hell and Hades will go into the lake of fire and be dealt with. And we will live in a time when we are face to face with God. Whoa. And not ashamed. And totally restored. And able to stand in the presence of God. You know what happens throughout the Scripture when people see one of the minor manifestations of God's glory on this earth? Bam! They are on their face, out cold. Look at it. In the book of Revelation, Jesus appears to John, the disciple who John describes himself as, well, I'm the one that Jesus loved. You know, I got to sit next to him in the Last Supper. I actually got to lean my head against his breast and just kind of, ah, because Jesus loves me. And what happens when he sees a glorified Jesus? Bam, it says, I fell on my face as dead. And Jesus revived him happens throughout but what will happen 
as recounted in the book of Revelation in the last few chapters, is we will stand in the presence of God. We will be enabled to stand because He is able to make us stand, not only in this life, but in the next life, to be able to worship Him, to be able to see Him as He really is and not just explode into minor little molecules. It's awesome. It's awesome. God is making the way for us. And His desire is that all would be in that place of being able to stand before Him. And that is woven especially through these next two chapters that we'll look at where He says, return. Return. Return to Me. He recounts what has happened, what they have done, but He says, return. Come back. Interesting in the Hebrew, we're going to see the term backsliding and return, and they are both related to the same word. They both come out of the same word. Return and backslide. And the Lord says, return, return. And he begins in chapter 3 by saying, they say if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet, return to me says the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not lain with men? By the road you've sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness and you have polluted the land with your harlotries, with your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld. There's been no latter rain. You've had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not from this time cry to me, my father, you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. Keep your finger right there in Jeremiah and turn back to the book of Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible. It give you a little insight into what he says there at the beginning about if a man, if a woman leaves her husband and is joined to another man, can she go back to that man? Wouldn't the land be polluted by that? Well, he's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 24 and other places in the book of the law which specifically talk about that. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, look at what it says. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Okay? Now, we could spend the next hour talking about, well, what about divorce, Pastor? And, and what about this? If, if, if you know, what, what about this situation happening today? Let's not go there, okay? It's not important. It's the law. The law has been totally fulfilled. And working this out in the practicalities of your life, if you have been divorced and remarried, and maybe you've been restored to your first husband, am I wrong now? Am I polluted? Is that why America's got a problem? Because I polluted the land? Don't go there. That's not what we're talking about. God is making a point through Jeremiah. But I wanted you to see why he started at this point. Because notice the situation. The law says if a man and woman are married, the man divorces the woman, she goes and becomes another man's wife, and he divorces her or he dies, it would be wrong for that woman to remarry the first husband. Okay? That's the law. That's the context. Now we go back to Jeremiah and the Lord using this imagery of the Lord as the husband, Israel as the wife. 
He says, okay, now listen, you remember the law, you know, that, you know, man divorces his wife, she goes, you know, can't go back, the land would be polluted. Now what have you done? What you have done is you didn't go and get married to another person and then be divorced and then try and come back. No, you've gone like a harlot. You have gone and you're like out in the Arabian desert pursuing other lovers. Not even like the city prostitutes who in the day would sit in a per particular area of the city. Gosh, some things haven't changed, have they? Some sins have continued since, well, since the garden, right? And he says, you're not doing that. You're running after this one and that one like a wild, wanton woman. That's what you've done. He's trying to make them see the gravity of the sin. He says, yet return to me. Yet return to me. God's heart is that even though their sin is so bad, he wants them to return. There is no sin so great. There is no sin so great that it separates you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus except one. And that is not to receive that love, to refuse that love and not accept it. God will not force you to follow Him. So that is the one sin that can separate you from God. Your choice to remain separated. But other than that, there is nothing. Paul says it in Romans 8. He says, I believe there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Height, depth, things past, things future, principalities, powers, anything you can name in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But we need to hear that voice that says, come to me. Now I look around the room this morning and I can hear minds going, gosh, I wish I brought my unsaved friend to hear this. They need to hear this. I know this already. I mean, I'm already a Christian. I don't need this, but gosh, I wish I brought them. Well, I brought you. I wish you'd brought them too, actually. Absolutely. And don't don't ever, you know, say, gosh, I, I can't invite my friend because, well, they're not a Christian. So maybe they'll become one here. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But this is not just a one time deal. This is a this is a continuing episode in our lives. We are not pure. We are not 100% this or 100% that. We're not 100% for the Lord and then 100% not for the Lord. No, we're a mixture. It's all mixed up in there. We're not building only with gold and precious stones on the foundation. Or we're not just only building with wood, hay, and stubble. We're taking wood, hay, and stubble and we're putting precious jewels and stuff in it and trying to build with that. And so the house that we are building, and I'm using an illustration that Paul uses from Corinthians where he says, I lay the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Nobody can lay any other foundation. There it is. But you get to build with it and you get to choose what you build with. Go to Lowe's, go to Home Depot, go to Busy Beaver, go to your backyard, wherever you go, you get to go and choose the building materials. Now, will you build with something that is going to last or will you build with something Something that isn't worth it, doesn't have the strength to support anything. And oh, by the way, the final test is it'll be tested by fire. Okay, well then wood, hay, and stubble really wouldn't be the best thing to, burn, to, to use, would it? Because if it's going to be tested by fire, well, the hay, the stubble, the wood, right? It might last a couple seconds longer, but man, it's going, right? 
But what happens to the precious metals? They become more purified. The little bit of stuff that's in there is taken away and it becomes more pure. What do we build with? I look at my own house that I have been building for the last however many years, 37 years. I say, man, some really good spots to that house. And there's hay sticking out of the middle of it. You know? What? What am I doing? It's every day. We need to hear that voice in our heart and spirit that the Lord is speaking. Come unto me. Return to me. Return to me. The problem is the enemy wants us to believe that we need to hide from him. He wants us to believe that, oh, but wait a minute. You crossed that line. Oh, you knew better. Oh, you did this one before. You've repented of this before. And now here you are again. Are you kidding me? Are you going to go to God now? What do you think he's going to say? What would you say? Right? Someone burns you again and again and again and then comes back one more time and says, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I've had enough, buddy. I've had enough. The Lord will never say to you, I've had enough. Oh, He won't say, oh, it's all right. It's okay. It it, it doesn't really matter. Oh, no, He's not going to say that. Absolutely not. Sin is death. And God knows it better than any of us. But He will never say, I've had enough, go away. He says, return to Me. And if we can get that concept in our brains, along with the concept of who God is, we will never go anywhere else when we find ourselves a little off to the left, a little off to the right. We won't try and go hide ourselves from God. Psalm 139 says, there's nowhere I can go to hide from you. Of course you're going to be there up in heaven, but I could make my my bed in the depths of Sheol, the place of death in hell itself, and you're there too. I can't get anywhere where you are not. You know, read the story of Adam and Eve and... You know, they sinned and then they went, oh no, I have no clothes on. I need to put some clothes on. And says they went and they got fig leaves and put them on them and so forth. And lots of different stories about fig leaves are not really big enough to be appropriate. Fig leaves would cause irritation to the skin. All of that's interesting and funny, but the main part of it is we try and hide ourselves in ways that You know, it'd be kind of like looking at Adam and Eve coming down with fig leaves going. And the Lord going, hey, what's going on? Hey, nothing. Nothing. Uh, New clothes. Oh, yeah, we just, we just, you know, just it's the new style we're coming up with. It's what's in this year. Right? And that's what we do. We just, we just kind of, you know, before the Lord, we just kind of put these things on because we are putting our own feelings and emotions and abilities onto God. Well, He could never forgive me for this. Well, He wouldn't really want me to be in His presence knowing that this is going on until I get this all taken care of. So I'll take care of this. I've got... I've got my sewing room where I'm sewing fig leaves together like crazy. And once that suit of fig leaves is really complete, then I'll go before the Lord and go, all right, Lord, I'm back. And we'll look like Adam and Eve sticking fig leaves. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The Lord says, look and learn. Look and learn. Take a look at it. Verse 6. The Lord also said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. 
And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister, Judah, saw it. Now remember, two kingdoms, Israel, after the time of Solomon, divided into a northern kingdom called Israel, southern kingdom called Judah. Israel, about a hundred years before the time that this was written and spoken from Jeremiah, Israel had been judged and overrun by the Assyrians and basically was no more. Okay? So that's the context in the time that, that people are hearing this and what the Lord is saying. He says, Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land, committed adultery with stones and trees, and yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense. Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go, proclaim these words toward the north and say, return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Israel had been judged for her idolatries about a hundred years before this. And God had called continually for her to repent and to return, but she rejected. And so judgment fell through the Assyrians. And he says, Judah, you're worse because you had the perfect object lesson here for understanding what will happen, and it really will happen. You see, many people believe that, oh, well, God would never really do that to his own people. Oh, he chastises us. He makes things kind of tough and, you know, well, kind of really tough, but we're his chosen people. Come on now, God isn't just going to scatter us to the four winds, even though that's what he said. But God does what he says. God does what he says. And here's Judah looking, and in the midst of this time of Josiah, God puts his finger right on what's going on. Did you notice it? Verse 10, he says, For all this her treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, but only in pretense. God doesn't want your outside. He wants your inside. God doesn't want your ritual and your habits. He wants your heart. God doesn't want you to just come to church. He wants you to come to church but not just come to church. He wants you to come to Him. Return to Me, says the Lord. Return to Me. God's anger is not forever. You know, when we get hurt by someone, There comes a time when sometimes we will cut them off totally. You know, you, you've, you've crossed some line in my graciousness and my ability to be merciful to you. So that even if they honestly come back, genuinely come back seeking forgiveness, we are incapable or unwilling to do that. That's not God. God is merciful. There is no sin so great. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But notice what he says here. He says, come to me honestly. Come to me honestly. Don't tell me it was the woman you gave me. She didn't take that piece of fruit and jam it into Adam's mouth. Here, eat this, quick. I did. You'll love it. No. It just says she gave it to him. And Adam willingly partook. Don't say, well, it was the serpent who deceived me. 
No, you chose to do what the serpent said rather than what I explicitly told you. You chose to disobey instead of obey. You chose to say the serpent's words hold more validity than God's word. Oh, that's still happening today. There are a lot of serpent words out in this world. And a lot of people, even within the household of faith, are putting more importance on the serpent's words than on the Word of God Almighty. It makes no sense when we put it into that context, but (laughs) you may have found yourself close to or even crossing that line of saying, well, this makes more sense to me. It must be this way. I don't know why it says that must be different in the Hebrew or the Greek. No, the Word of God is true. It's living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide between our soul and our spirit as if between bone and marrow so that we are equipped for every good work God has called us to. We don't get the option to make up faith. We get the option to obey His Word or not obey His Word. And we get the option to live in the consequences of each of those. And in the midst of all of that, God, unlike us, doesn't say, hey, there's the line, you crossed it. He says, you crossed the line, return to me. Return to me. But we are called to acknowledge honestly where we're at. Man, we are so good at justifying. We justified all kinds of stuff. We justify to our boss at work. Well, well, you know, the, the traffic on, on 79 today, it was really bad. You know, and, and that's why I'm 15 minutes late. It has nothing to do that I got up late or has nothing to do that I decided to watch the news a little bit longer or read that extra article. You know, and man, the traffic was really bad. We don't say that's why we were late. We just say, oh, the traffic was really bad. Right? I didn't lie. Did I lie? Sure you did. Come on. God says, be honest with me. Acknowledge where you are. The book of 1 John, John tells us that if we say we have not sinned, we're making God a liar. Whoa! (laughs) I don't want to do that. If you want to do that, please step outside the building (laughs) so it doesn't explode. No. We, we all do that to some extent, don't we? Because we're so used to justifying to our boss, to our friends, to our family, to our wife, to our husband, to our kids, to our parents, to the world, justifying why we do the things that we do. God says, acknowledge your iniquity. Acknowledge it. Come to me honestly. Don't come to me with pretense covered with fig leaves. Come to me honestly and openly. In verses 14 through 20, what the Lord says is He he uses the image of marriage once again. In verse 14, He says, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you. I am married to you. I will take you. And then he gives some promises. Look at verse 15. He says, I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Feed you with knowledge and understanding. May the Lord God Almighty make me a shepherd like that. That's my desire. Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Well, yeah, I do, Lord. Well, then, Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, I do love you. Well, then then tend to my lambs. Okay, okay. Peter, do you even like me? Lord, why do you say that? You know I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. That's the model that God has given for pastors, for teachers, for every one of you too, not just pastors and teachers, but as you share your faith, as you give to those who are outside or within the household of faith, why do you do it? 
Well, to show them how great I know the Bible, Pastor. Been studying it for years. Got half of it memorized, and I can impress people with that. Well, to prove to God how holy I am. Get into the, you know, the uh, executive club of Christianity, you know, so I get to on board sooner. I get the preferred seating during the rapture if I'm in the executive club. <laughs> We're the first ones up in the first class area heading up, right? It's great. That's why I do this stuff. No, out of a heart of feeding, of giving, of giving the goodness of God. God has given us such goodness. God has given us such mercy and grace. How can we give out anything else? How can we say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy that grace and that mercy thing. Oh, man, I love that. But I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to be gracious to others. They don't deserve it. I'm not going to be merciful to others. Do you know what they did? Do you know what they said about me? <laughs> Chris and I just went through a, a, a hilarious experience of someone totally outside of, of this fellowship, someone none of you could possibly know, who was, we found, saying all kinds of nasty things about Krista. But then suddenly, you know, last night we were uh, with this person and they were hugging and everything else. And it was just kind of like, hmm. you know why it happened, I believe? But God, but God, if you give according to God's plan, there is the possibility that a heart and life can be changed. It's not guaranteed because there is that will thing in other people. But if you give back what's being given to you, guaranteed, all you're going to get in return is the same. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the same judgment that you meet out, you will be judged. That's talking about that critical spirit that people can have about everybody else. Well, what do people think about that person who's got that critical spirit? They're usually pretty critical about them, right? Right? That's how it works. But if we give grace and mercy and God's love, you know what? You still might get that critical stuff back in your face. But the Lord says, hey, you are so blessed. You know when that happens, that's so blessed. Because you know what? That's what happened to me too. Wouldn't you love to be able to sit down with Jesus and say, Lord, man, this, this just happened to me. And he goes, you know what? That happened to me too. Really? Oh, how cool. You know? And then you can go around and say, man, I did stuff just like Jesus. <laughs> you know, I was saying, this happened to me, Jesus. And he said, yeah, that happened to me too. Well, that's exactly it. He says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. Man, you're in great company. They did that to prophets for hundreds of years. Blessed are you when that happens. But Lord, it doesn't feel good. Whoever said a blessing always felt good. There are hard blessings when we face those things. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That doesn't mean he was on the cross full of joy. He was on the cross full of anguish. He was on the cross the one who knew no sin, taking on all of the sin of the world and being separated from God for people who would never accept the fact that He did that for them. Wow. That's not joy. No, but the joy is the day when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall rise up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. I imagine the Lord looking down at that moment and seeing all these human beings just shoo, shoo, shoo. He is going to be so full of joy. That's the joy set before Him is those who have been changed because of His grace and because of His mercy. He says, I will give you shepherds according to my heart. He says, I will care for you. I will care for you. And then finally, in verse 21, 
He says, a voice was heard in the desolate heights, weeping supplications of the children of Israel. For they've perverted their way and they've forgotten the Lord their God. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. And I will heal your black, your backsliding. God brings true healing. When we return to Him, He brings true healing. Those fig leaves that we put all over us sometimes, we're hoping they'll act like bandages and keep us from spiritually bleeding to death. Oh, I'll take care of this. I'll take care of this gash on the side. I'll just stick a fig leaf on here. That'll keep it all in. God doesn't use bandages only. God doesn't just give painkillers only. God brings healing. Man, sometimes that healing means, boy, there's a lot of stuff I got to cut out of there. That's, that's going to hurt, but otherwise you will die. You know, if the doctor said that to you this afternoon after you walked out of here and felt bad, stopped in the emergency room, you got to the hospital, and the doctor said, you've got a tumor, I've got to take that out right now. If I don't, you'll be dead in 24 hours. But if I take it out, you're going to live, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be better than you were before. Would you go, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think about that. How long did you say I have? And yet spiritually, isn't that what we do sometimes? The Lord is saying, let me cut that out. Let me take that away. And we're going, eh, but I think I like it. I think I like this death in me. God brings true healing. I heard a story about a guy who had the habit of ending his prayers saying, and Lord, clear out the cobwebs in my heart. Oh, what, what a wonderful image. But he would say that after every prayer at a prayer meeting. And finally, one of the other people at this prayer meeting, after he prayed that and said once again, and Lord, please clear the cobwebs out of my heart. He stood up and said, and Lord, kill that spider. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what we need. That's what we need. We spend our time so often cleaning out the cobwebs and the Lord is going, let's kill the spider. Let's kill the spider. True healing brings stability. True healing brings stability. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Return to me, and if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. Then you shall not be moved. Ephesians 4, 14, jot it down in your Bible and read it later. It says that Paul, Paul prays and he, he talks about why the church was created the way it is and why he's, why the Lord said, okay, well, in the church I'm going to put, well, I'm going to put some apostles and I'm going to put some, I'm going to put some, uh, let's see, well, I put, I'll put some evangelists. I'll put some prophets. I'll, I'll put some, I'll put some pastor teachers and some evangelists. Why? And one of the reasons he says is so that you are no longer children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Oh, annihilationism? Hey, that sounds pretty good. Oh, what about, oh, what about faith? I get anything I want. I like that one. I'm going to take that one. And I've known people who have just been like they are living on the sea in a little bitty rowboat in the midst of the storm. Have you ever watched that show on, I think it's on the Learning or Travel Channel about the guys who go out and do the deep sea fishing and I think it's the North Atlantic or whatever. They bring the big the gigantic crates of crabs and, you know, oh, it's amazing. And you watch them sometimes on these huge waves and these boats are just being tossed all over the place. And some people's lives are like that. Because they are affected by every little wind of doctrine coming here and there and here and there. And the Lord is saying, return to me and you will not be moved. You will not be moved. So how do we do this? This, this sounds great, Pastor, this, this, this return thing. They're going to want a little bit of that. How do I do that? 
Take a look at verse 3. Chapter 4. He says, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise, your, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. He says, break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that has been plowed at one time and then left alone. That's why I think this is so much a message, not for an unbeliever, but for a believer. Hey, you broke up this ground before, plowed, and it was ready to take the seed of the Word of God to be implanted and let fruit bring forth righteousness in your life. But then you never, you never put the seed in. You know? If you plow for a garden and you don't put any seeds in, well, other stuff's going to grow up that you don't really want and you're not going to be able to eat most of it. Right? Break up that fallow ground. Break up those areas where, oh, I, I got that down. I did that back when I was, I understood that years ago when I was in that other church. They, we taught that and man, we had a conference on it for six months and I've got that down and the Lord's saying, no, you don't. <laughs> Break it up. Break up that fallow ground. Jesus uses the image of the sower who goes to sow the seed of the Word of God. And the seed that brings forth righteousness is the seed that falls on good soil. We are the soil keepers. Break up the fallow ground. Don't sow among the thorns. Sow in the places where the ground is broken up. And circumcise your heart. Circumcision was a sign of being separated unto God. That's what the whole... I am a man who is in the covenant of God. And that's one of the outward ways that they would identify that. Today, baptism is an outward sign of an inward change to say to the world, yep, I am a follower of Jesus Christ so much so that I'm going to let a pastor dunk me under the water to bring forth the image of what's happened in my heart. He says, circumcise your heart, not just the outside, but the heart. Don't just get dunked in water. Let your whole being be immersed in the Lord and be brought forth into the places where God wants you to be. Can you hear him this morning? He's saying, return, return. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word, for the goodness, even the parts that hurt, Lord, of Your Word. Father, I pray that You would be glorified through the working of Your Word by Your Spirit in each one of us. Lord, in whatever area of our life it is that You are calling for us to return to You, Lord, I pray that we would hear and we would obey. Lord, I thank You that there is nothing that stands between Your love and us except our choice as to whether to receive Your love or not. Lord, I pray that each one of us would receive that love, return to You in every way in our life and be strengthened and stabilized for living in this perverse world. Lord, that we might truly be oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord in this day and age. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and grant you peace each and every day of your life through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, and our soon coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you.